in our scripture this morning, um, Paul says, I am being poured out like a dream fall. Somehow I think he got broken and spilled out. We're going to be, I invite you to turn uh, to your sermon notes once again. We're going to begin our message this morning the same way we have over the last three weeks. Um, I warned you about this, that I wanted to encourage you to memorize these two verses. But this morning's going to be a little bit different. I don't want you to say it. I want you to declare it. To declare it. You understand the difference? It's one thing to say, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And then there's something else that I want. I want to know Christ. Will you stand with me? If you still need help, you got the words in front of it. Let's declare it together. I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. Philippians 3. 10 and 11. You may be seated. Now so many of us in our lives and even in the church our declaration goes more like this. I hope I'm good enough that when I die I get to go to hell. Anybody like that? I, I, I just I just want to go someplace better. I, I, want, a, I, I want a nice easy life where everything goes according to my plans, right? When the weather's always perfect, when I always get my way. Paul says, I want to know Christ. You, saw, you see, I believe that Paul understood something that many of us that we don't get. That Paul understood the bigger picture of salvation. Now let me explain to you what I mean. When I was a young Christian, this is what I thought salvation meant. That I subscribed to a certain set of beliefs. And I basically signed on the dotted line. And then I got to go to heaven when I die. And, but until I die, I get to live the way, any old way I want to live. Right? That's kind of the way I, I, I understood it. But the more I grow as a Christian, that that, that evening, about 11 o'clock at night, in October of 1980, I was 18 years old. You can do the math if you want to have fun. I had a little girl this morning that wanted me to pick her up, and I picked her up, and she started running her fingers through my hair, and she goes, your hair is really white. And I mean, so you can do the math if you want. But, you know, when I... When I'm, I'm coming to see that when, when I knelt beside my bed in my dorm room and I asked Jesus to come into my life, that just got me to first base. That was just part one of salvation. You see, Scripture um, presents two truths, two major truths. In Scripture, they, at first glance, they appear to be contradictory. But in actuality, they are quite complementary. Truth number one, we cannot work 
for our salvation. Salvation is a gift. Salvation can only be received back when we, before the pandemic, when, when on communion Sundays, you would come forward and many of you would have your hands open. Y'all know why you do that? Because it's a gift. Salvation is a gift. And a gift cannot be earned. A gift cannot be worked for. A gift can only be received. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, the Apostle Paul says this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And it's not of yourselves. It is the what? The gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. So on the one hand, we can't work for our salvation. You can never be good enough to deserve the cross. You can't be good enough to deserve communion. I can't either. But you can receive it. See, on the one hand, truth number one is we cannot work for our salvation. You can't earn it. Truth number two, we must work out our salvation. Last week in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, we, we finished out with this verse that where Paul says, continue to work out your salvation. Continue literally means to continue working out your salvation or continuing to work out your salvation doesn't mean doing it once and then retiring. And they just say, well, back in the day, I was working out my salvation. No, if you have a pulse this morning, which is at least 75% of you, there's a few of you I'm, I'm wondering about, but, you know, Mary Harmon Katrina, but I mean, I'm just, I'm just, you know, I'm just wondering, but, you know, if you have a pulse, continue to work out your salvation. Contradictory? Complimentary? By the way, one verse that I left out of your sermon notes this morning, um, I, I put um, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for it is by grace you have been saved, and it's not from yourselves, it is a gift of God. You know what verse 10 of Ephesians 2 says? For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You know, the process, as we saw last week, the first half of the gospel, or maybe two weeks ago, I can't remember, but the first half of the gospel is justification, getting saved. The second half is sanctification, becoming like Jesus. Mm, how do you do that? Well, here it is in a nutshell. God works it in, but we work it out. God works it in us, but we work it out. And so that brings us to the next passage here in Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 14. Do everything. Oh, man, I hate this verse. I mean, this is, I, I, I should have gotten another translation. You, you want to read the first verse with me here out loud? Let's do it. Out loud. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. You can read the 
rest of them. Now, of course, the translators got it all mixed up because what Paul really meant was to do most things, right? To do, to pray about, not grumbling or arguing, right? One day a week. Give them, give them one day a week. Right? Don't grumble and argue on less say or those doggone liberals. <laughs> those cotton-picking conservatives. Do all things. Literally all things means all things. It's all inclusive. How in the world am I ever going to do that? You know, I was curious what grumbling really means, so I got on my phone and I Googled. Um, you know, the phones are wonderful little computers you carry around in your pocket, aren't they? You know, I, I Googled, what is a synonym for grumbling? Complaining. What's the first synonym that came up? Then I started doing that. Little bit of, a, a, a little bit of research and you know there's actually different types of complainers or complaining or grumblers. Grumblers. First kind is chronic complainers. Chronic complainers, you may know one, quit looking at me. Chronic complainers are never satisfied. Chronic complainers actually it works this way. They complain so much <clears throat> where their brain actually becomes rewired, where complaining becomes the default action no matter what. You know somebody like that? If you don't, <clears throat> maybe when you look in the mirror, just saying. But no, I'm just, no. Chronic complainers. That no matter what, they can always find something to complain about. And instead of looking at their sin of complaining, they justify it because somebody else is wrong. And they spend their life complaining. There's another kind of complaining. We call it venting. Venting. Have you ever just had to vent. You know what I mean? Venters have some kind of emotional dissatisfaction. Venters, by the way, venters always have an agenda. They always have an agenda. Always. And by the way, <laughs> their agenda ain't you. It's them. Venomers. There's a third type of complaining. It's a little bit more constructive. And that's what I call strategic complaining. Now, strategic complainers are all about solving problems. So let me just ask you this. Think about the last time you complain, either out loud to somebody else or just to yourself, okay? I can complain like crazy sometimes just when I'm by myself. But think about the last time you complained. Now let me ask you this. What did you do to help solve that problem? Anything? If your answer is nothing, then don't claim to be a strategic complainer. You see, strategic complaining, the experts tell us that that is just a very small percentage of um, the complaining that takes place. And, and by the way, if anybody in here feels like I'm looking at you, I'm not. Because in my mind, I've got a mirror. 
because I can be one of the world's worst complainers. And Paul's words here in Philippians chapter 2, do all things without grumbling, complaining, and arguing. Hit me between the eyes. If anybody had a right to grumble and complain, it would be Paul. And it wasn't um, because the service went wrong. His grumbling and complaining was, well, he would, I would think he had the right because he was in prison. Things weren't going his way. Hmm. But Paul understood that he had a bigger purpose in life. His purpose was to know Christ. In the power of his resurrection, in the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, which for Paul meant to be broken and spilled out, poured out like a drink offering, being a total sacrifice for the good of the Philippian believers. Paul understood what I hadn't quite gotten, that life wasn't about his comfort. Life was much bigger than that. Paul understood some Christians in what we call the Reformed tradition. They grow up with, with in some cases, memorizing this from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Not, these are not all Catholics, but, but some of them grow up by learning ever since they were little in Sunday school, they learned this, that the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. I don't come from the Reformed tradition, but I agree with that. But what does it mean to glorify God? Anybody know? It means to magnify Him. To glorify literally means to make God look good. And when I grumble and complain because I bear the name Christian, not because I'm a pastor, because I bear the name Christian, when I grumble and complain, God's reputation takes a hit. Friends, God's reputation is at stake. That's why this is so, so important. God's reputation is at stake. I've read one of the best books on Christian leadership that I've ever read. It's a book called um, Canoeing the Mountains by Todd Bolsinger. And Todd Bolsinger is on staff at Fuller Seminary out in California. It's not a Methodist school, but, um, but Todd Bolsinger says that every Christian leader needs different kinds of people in his life. Whether you're a choir director youth director, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a banker, whether you work at the courthouse, you own your own business, whether you're a professor at the college, every leader needs at least three kinds of people in their life. He says we need friends. Friends. Friends are more concerned about, they care more about us than they do our mission and what we're doing. They care more about us. I'm blessed to have some friends in my life. 
Um, some of those are friends in the ministry. And one of my best friends in the ministry is, is Ray. And when Ray and I talk, that Ray loves to ask me, so Steve, how are you doing? He's more interested in how I am doing than what we are doing here in Livingston. We all need friends, don't we? Who love us more for who we are than for what we do. Do you have a friend? I hope so. But we also need mentors. Now mentors are people who have walked the road that we are currently on earlier on in their life. There's a Baptist preacher in York, Alabama. His name is Leon Bauer. Brother Leon, I believe, how old is he? Is he in his 80s? Brother Leon has become a mentor for me because Brother Leon has, some of you know him, feel free to but Brother Leon has um, taken in his ministry, he has taken unpopular steps at times where he has been shot at. And it's taken a lot of criticism. And when I get shot at and take criticism, you know, sometimes I would go to Brother Leon and say, you got plans for lunch? You know, one thing about Leon is that he doesn't give me advice until I ask for it. I have a lot of people giving me advice, 99% of the time, it's not advice that I'm asking for, but they're very eager to give it to me. And they never walk the road that I'm walking, but Brother Leon has. He's become a mentor to me. Do you have a mentor in your life? Well, maybe I should ask for some of you who are in your twilight years, who are you a mentor for? Third kind of person we need in our lives, partners, partners. Think of this image. I'm going to give you two images to think on. You see, anybody that's ever doing anything worthwhile, sometimes they feel like they are crawling out on a limb by themselves. And there's all different kinds of people. There are some that when you crawl out on a limb by yourself, they're standing at the base of the tree, cranking up the chainsaw. And others will stand there at the base of the tree and just go, good job, good job. You know what a partner does? A partner climbs out there on the limb with you. Second in the tree is this. We have Many brave men and women who have served our country, John Ryan, I'm looking at you, who have served our country. Do we have any other veterans here this morning? Okay. But we have others in our church and our community. You know, and sometimes we'll have parades, Veterans Day parades. You know, fans will go to a parade, get a little flag, get a little American flag, and wave that flag. But you know what a partner does? A partner crawls in the foxhole with you. Partner isn't just waving a flag. A partner is willing to take the ball. I suggest to you that we all need friends, we need mentors, and we need partners.
But I also want to suggest to you that we need to be friends, mentors, and partners. Carol Nixon, you better partner to me. Carol, um, started reading the Seabed Daily Text. I don't even know how long ago. Some of you are reading it um, as part of this study on Philippians. Carol, your constant encouragement and your prayers have made me feel that when I take, when I, sometimes when I feel like I'm crawling out on a limb by myself, that I don't know how you got that walker all the way up into that tree, but you crawled out there with me. Thank you. You know, Paul had two partners. One's name was Timothy. The other was Epaphroditus. Let me read. Just follow along with me. I'm not going to read the whole passage, you got it before you. But let me just read what Paul says about Timothy in verse 20. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. Several things stick out to me there. The phrase genuine concern. Here's my question. How genuine is my concern? Second phrase is, Could it be said of me that I look out for the interests of Jesus or my own interests? Partner. It's all about looking out for the interests of Jesus, for the welfare of others. The second partner that Paul had was Epaphroditus. You can read about Epaphroditus there in your sermon notes, but understand this, that back in the first century, that when someone was in a, in a Roman prison, the state, the Roman government, didn't provide for the prisoners. It was up to family members or friends to provide food, clothing to provide for those prisoners. The Philippians took Paul on as a mission project and they sent a guy named Epaphroditus to, to be their emissary, to be their representative, to go and, and serve Paul. But while Epaphroditus had left Philippi, the city of Philippi, to go to Rome, he got sick. He got so sick where Paul says he almost died. But Epaphroditus was not deterred. He went and did his job because Epaphroditus was just as concerned about Paul's mission as Paul was. So let me ask you, do you have friends, mentors, and partners in your life? Think of those. And how about this? 
Who are you a friend for? True friend. Not a social media friend. True friend. Who are you a mentor to? Every one of us in here, with the exception of maybe a little baby, to be a mentor to someone. Who are you a partner? Or are you satisfied with waving a flag because no commitment is necessary? Well, what all God's really need is someone crawling foxhole with So how do you do that? Go back to Philippians 2 12, 2 13. Right after Paul says, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, he says this For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. What if? Community was not just thanking God for sending Jesus and giving us the gift of eternal life. What if communion is actually just as much about empowering us to live this present? with the second half of the gospel. To empower us to work out the salvation that has been worked in us. I'm not going to read the letter to you this morning. just want you to imagine. Get your communion elements ready. And I want you to imagine being there in the upper room. There's 13 of you there. The way ahead is going to be challenging. And you are going to need God's strength, not just your strength. And in the middle of the Passover meal, Jesus takes bread and he broke it. And he passed it around to his disciples. And he said, Take this <coughs> for this is my body given. Will you take? supper was over, Jesus took the cup and he blessed it. He gave thanks over it. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood poured out for you and for me for the forgiveness of sins. Will you take it?
way God works it in. It's a gift that can only be received. But when He works it in, that's just step one. First base, if you will. As you leave here, go and work it out. Work it out in your relationship.